everybody. Welcome to another episode of The Nonprofit Show. We are so excited. This is what we call a big get in the business. We have Jane Wales um, talking to us today about the Generosity Commission's Insight re uh, Report. And Jane is, is uh, Vice President of the Aspen Institute, a woman that is doing a lot of things for our sector and really exploring information that we need to know and we need to gather. And so we're going to be really focusing in on this amazing report. And so welcome again to another episode of The Nonprofit Show. Um, I'm Julia Patrick. If we haven't met, I'm CEO of the American Nonprofit Academy. Jarrett Ransom, the nonprofit nerd, is off today and she'll be joining us back tomorrow. We are here because we have amazing partners and they include Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, your part-time controller, nonprofit thought leader, Fundraising Academy at National University, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Nerd, and Nonprofit Tech Talk. These are the folks that have allowed us to do our work without any editorial pressure or content design for now in our fourth year, almost 900 episodes. And so we want to make sure that um, everybody knows that this largesse helps support our work. If you've missed any of our episodes, and we have episodes that talk about fundraising, board development, management, grants, policy, oh my gosh, I could go on and on. You can find these recordings on podcast format, streaming broadcast, and now we have a new, I like to call it sexy app, that our team at American Nonprofit Academy created. So you can find all of this content. It's free, you can access it when you need it, and we will help join you in the discovery to building a stronger nonprofit. Okay, Jane Wales, you heard my homework or my housekeeping, and now we're gonna dig into you and get your wisdom. Again, Vice President of the Aspen Institute, Executive Director um, Programming on Philanthropy and Social Innovation, and, more, and today while you're here is really co-chair of the Generosity Commission. It's such a fascinating, um, piece of the pie, if you will. And so I recommend everybody to, to take some time and go to the generositycommission.org website. It's a, it's a fascinating um, look into what this information, how it was gathered and sourced and why it was done. And it's a very limited thing. So Jane, talk to me about the Generosity Commission, because this is a very special action. <laughs> I mean, thanks, thanks for that lovely introduction. Um, I, I am struck by how hard you work. <laughs> uh, the beneficiaries of your great work. So, so thank you for that. Uh, and thank you for shining a light on the Generosity Commission. Um, I'll say a word about who we are, what you know, what and why we are. Um, so, uh, we're, we're basically we're a group of seventeen leaders from across the social sector. It ranges from, and I should first say that my co-chair is Mike Gian Giannone, who is CEO of BlackBot. So there is a, somebody with a clear private sector perspective. Uh, um, but also when you look at it, it, it sort of ranges from the leader of, of PolicyLink, which is a wonderful advocacy organization on the one hand, and the leader of Salvation Army, which is known for its neutrality on the other. Or when it comes to fundraising, there's, there's the leader of, of Lever for Change. You know, on, on the one hand, and uh, AARP <laughs> on the other, um, and and so it's a, it's a good range of, of individuals. It, it's not just a commission. We also have task forces, uh, which we can turn to on a variety of issue areas. And it's most important, we reach out to and conduct focus groups with everyday givers and volunteers. To get back to I, I probably should give you the why. Why are we there? Uh, why are we not only focused on our day jobs? And the answer is that uh, a few years back, uh, the Giving Institute was sponsored Giving USA at the end of a report on trends in giving, landed on two data points that are really consistent. Uh, the first is that year over year, uh, the, uh, more money is given by fewer givers. Year over year, and this is the most striking data point, my perspective, more volunteer hours are given by people. So you can argue, okay, 
uh, this data point on giving, um, that that reflects the consultation as well, which is a concern in and of itself, right? But in the concentration of volunteering, you've got to ask yourself, is there a corresponding, uh, put, it, put it one way, is, is there a corresponding concentration of agents? We form a large part of our society believe that what they do doesn't that they, they don't influence events through their choices their answers. Um, but if that is the case, what does that mean for our democracy? Because our system of government assumes an engaged citizen. So what we want is to better understand that and to see whether there are ways that, to reverse that, either to to uh, to help folks engage in whatever way works you know, with their values or you know, their circumstances, their passions, et cetera. Right. Um, you know, I love that you said that because I think a lot of times in the nonprofit sector, we look at something that maybe we see out of our car window as we're driving down the street and we're like, that's not right. But we don't often see the tentacles of import and how it navigates throughout democracy. And and I I love, love, love that you have identified that and, and helped us to remember this or be, you know, to not just look about wealth and money and where it's going, because it is it is very significant. And so uh, I really I just wanted to stop you and, and, and point that out that this is something that we don't hear enough. Um, and so we're talking about your goals. We're talking about the work that you do and, and that it's such an, a fascinating assortment of people that have come together. How easy or hard is it? I've got to ask this question to get these amazing minds and leaders to engage with you in this, in this piece. We've been we're so fortunate. I mean, we have remarkable leaders not only on the commission itself, but on the many task forces. And we're able to tap folks through their um, through their testimony. We've received testimony from uh, the uh, of, of all walks of life, and we'll be scheduling more uh, focus groups with the everyday givers. And I probably should define what an everyday giver is. Yes. But focus groups have to ask them, what motivates your giving and volunteering? And every time I say giving, I, I'm a giving a time. Uh, every day volunteers and every day difference. What motivates it? Number one, what gets in your way? And is there something that others can do to, to help remove those those barriers to that kind of civic um, so this is The way I think about what an everyday volunteer or giver is, it's it's basically the engaged citizen. Right? It, it, it is the person who uh, volunteers at the at the women's center. The, well, that is to say, who volunteers for the volunteer fire brigade, uh, who joins um, uh, Divine Nine uh, sororities and, and fraternities, or join the Rotary Club. Uh, these are people who uh, are engaged in democratic decision making. They're, they're how we work. It's how we, as a society, get stuff done. Uh, and so the everyday giver and volunteer is it, 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 it's not somebody who, who necessarily somebody who's got sort of uh, excess excess money in their in their um, in their banking account there aren't very many of, of us who do uh, but people who interested in checking right I love that you put that I love that you put that forward because I think it is important to redefine what um, a participant is and who gives and how we give. Um, it's it's really powerful. And thank you for, for reminding us that. I think a lot of times in the nonprofit sector, from the board all the way down, we're like, if we can just get that one wealthy person, all our problems are solved. Not the case. <laughs> it's not sustainable. It doesn't happen. <laughs> about something broader. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. We were just talking about um Phoenix where the temperature is what did you say it was 116 today? Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah. Well, the one dress was having San Francisco when we're in the high 50s and, and low 60s. So apologies for, for wearing a bit like here. Um, yeah, that's horrible. I don't want. I, yeah, it, it's absolutely horrible. You know, Jane, um, it's so fascinating to hear about your work, and I, I love the the assortment of people that you were able to get into the room and, and get around the table. Brilliant people that are on the the forefront of this huge discussion. Talk to us about, aside from just getting great minds together, what was your process and the methodology for for doing this work? So we are, uh, there's a three tranches of work, and the, the first is to commission research. Uh, and maybe I'll just focus on three, uh, three bits of research that were at a particular time for us. The first of a look at what we we did this very dramatic decline in every day giving. Uh, that is to say, we, we have 20 million giving households drop out of giving after the Great Recession. Um, and as I say, year over year, more more money is given, more time is given, but by fewer givers and volunteers. Yeah. We got that. So, so what we took a look at first is, okay, what sector or subsector is most affected by those trends? Sadly, mm-hmm. we found out um, that we learned that it is the small community-based people serve nonprofit that has seen the most dramatic drop off in, in, in and that was particularly concerning because we did undertook this research uh, as COVID was beginning. This was yeah. So of course that situation worsened with with COVID. They couldn't accept volunteers, you know, in, um, and and, you know, it was kind of dry, and and earned income if you came for a program of some sort could do that as well. So that was very concerning. We, that's a longitudinal study, though, so we will see the over the meaning of this. The temperature is taken over a four year period. Uh, the second thing we learned um, is we, we asked the question are we measuring the right things? We really focusing on uh, where the data is rich, and that is to say, we were focused on giving uh, for nonprofits, not the people who work with. And, and and never has been, never has been. Um, so we wanted to capture, or still want to capture, giving the direct, uh, a GoFundMe gift, right? So you're, you're, you're paying somebody's medical bill. Uh, when you're not mediated by a nonprofit, but also during that is direct, because what we've seen is a, a, a vast expense, to, a expense to the number of uh, mutual aid uh, networks that spontaneous. Uh, and look after their neighbors. So in the one case, you might be looking after strangers, and the other, you might be looking after your neighbors. We asked, what does that look like? Um, and what I can tell you is that giving and volunteering is quite broad. Uh, there's a range of ways that we could in, in life or in, in, in any life of the What we don't know, this is a, this, this is a little bit of future recommendations, what we don't know is whether the decline in giving to nonprofits is offset, like giving to volunteering for nonprofits is offset um, by this uh, unmediated, this direct volunteering. Thing. We don't know how much we're doing for before, right? So right. we don't have this line to go to, because these are traditional means. We can go fucking and make a uh, to, uh, you know, to, to, uh, to media, to, to, to social media, but um, we were always doing that as a society. So we don't know, we don't know what the baseline was. We don't know how much it's going up, although we know it is going up, how much it's going down or whether it's remaining the same. Right. So just skip ahead just to say one thing. One of our number one recommendations is let's build that knowledge set. Yeah. So that we understand generosity much more broadly in our society. Well, and I think the mechanism of generosity has changed because we do have this digital component where you can do things super fast on your phone. And and now it's not, it's, it's generational. So we can have children, teens, you know, all the way up to, you know, a digital society that can be like, oh my gosh, I'm going to donate 
to this or that. And I can transfer money. I can, you know, do a direct deposit kind of situation. It's, it's something that we're not talking enough about, but you're right. I mean, think about the transference of wealth through those means. And obviously, you face a big wealth transfer. Maybe the investors take the lead. Yeah, it's so fascinating. I love that you've done this work, and I love that um, your your um, your assortment of of knowledge and and I would say knowledge points and leaders um, have been willing to kind of take a look at what's going around on around them. I mean, you mentioned, you know, that you have people that are from the front lines of social services, like the Salvation Army, all the way to the CEO of BlackBot. I mean, people that are engaged in this atmosphere and in this ecosystem, but in different ways. And so they come back to you with, you know, different uh, sensibilities of what the inputs are. Talk to us about kind of what some of the key findings are um, that you maybe were you found yourself a little bit more surprised about or not necessarily thinking this is how it was going to go i mean this is the world that you walk in you know this stuff you're a part of this dialogue in your workaday world were there things that maybe somewhat surprised you <laughs> sorry <laughs> i wouldn't say the word it's fascinating and that is the most likely people to register to vote for the first time are people who have either volunteered for the first time or served on a jury for the first time. It's telling us that one form of social, pro-social behavior, of civic behavior, we have uh, And that the reality is that the kind of, and this is sort of the next wave that we're about to receive our final bit of research on, is the kind of social connectedness that is measured when you give or volunteer. Yeah. The of social connectedness actually translates into greater societal resilience. So the individual is going to Wow. Okay. I'm going to, uh, so during that amazing, amazing piece of information we had your sound cut out just a little bit and i just want to re rephrase this to make sure that we got this correct uh you're you're telling us that when we see people who have engaged in another form of social commitment and we don't often align voting i think in the nonprofit sector we try to stay away from the politics in a lot of ways <laughs> we're afraid of it frankly um but you're seeing people that navigated through some sort of, of if you will democratic process registering to vote voting it aligned them towards more volunteerism and even uh fundraising or participating so i i that is correct let me reverse it and say that what we're finding is that, that sense of social connectedness mm -hmm. with with giving and volunteering? You know that woman, right? <laughs> you know, we all feel that uh, that that sense of connectedness is it. that that uh, leads to that personal experience uh, translates into a society wide experience. So let me just put it differently: uh, that the notion is that when um, individuals uh, connect to society in those ways that, that they, and I'll give you the specific example, the most likely person to register to vote is someone who uh, volunteered for the first time or served on a jury for the first time. The point there being uh, that, that one pro-social behavior, one uh, civic engagement leads to others. And, and it's not about who you vote for, by the way, Julie. <laughs> It's a yeah. uh, and so we just find that that fascinating that one act leads to others you know jane i've been in one form or fashion of this sector through family through community through my profession 
you know, I'm in my early 60s. I've never heard that. I've never actually even thought of that. But it makes sense. I mean, you when you serve on boards, you you know the people that because they're serving on other boards in your community. I mean, you're right. I can see how engagement begets engagement. I mean, you you realize that this is important. It becomes a value. It becomes a way of life. Fascinating, fascinating. Um, wow, I, I love this. I'm so glad that uh, you shared that with us. You know, I our time has gone by so quickly and it's i i knew i warned you i'm like this is going to go by fast um and i know this is like a little bit of a crystal ball moment and so i, I know you're up for this but what do you see i mean with this knowledge and and this maybe a new approach to what's going on um what do you see for the future what's next it's interesting you say you asked that question because um uh, the last thing you want is a report that sits on the shelf. <laughs> yeah. And and so very much our method has been to stimulate conversation uh, throughout the process. Um, conversation. And I guess for us, um, we want the document to be a living document. We don't see ourselves as the last word, and we will be disappointed if we are. That would not be success. Uh, but instead, we see it as a start of a conversation. And so I imagine that, that uh, this, these recommendations will be will be uh, supplemented by others. Yeah. Uh, some we set aside is not as important, while others uh, more important than than you know. So what's most important to us, as we have important, is that this is part of an ongoing conversation, mm -hmm. and the, the report is a living document. Mm -hmm. I love that. And I I think that we are a part of a changing society. I mean, certainly we've been changed by the global pandemic and, and all of the things associated with that or things that have just been occurring around this. Um, so I, I really appreciate your approach to that because, yeah, we, we have a lot to learn and we are in a changing time. And if we don't, if we're not thinking about this, we're going to be shocked, you know, when, when something major changes course in the nonprofit sector and uh, we won't be able to na re navigate it. So super, super interesting. Talk to us about where we can find this report and um, how we, you know, a small nonprofit sitting in the middle of America <laughs> you know, can get this information and what that might look like. So, so the report's not completed. It'll be launched for the next Right. April of the way to get that, but also the way to get um, some of the findings of our surveys um, and focus groups and uh, the conclusions of the of the, the information. Folks can go online to uh, www.thegenerositycommission.org. Right. Yeah, I think it's great, and I think it's something to bookmark to keep going back to 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 get this amazing information no matter the size of your nonprofit this is something that is going to ultimately impact you and your community and your sector and um, you know nobody in our country could really ever convene this type of group and pull this together and will cost a, a fortune and in, in, in resources and so to be able to get this uh, in front of this group and, and understand what they're doing. It is really important. I think, Jane, this is worthy of a board's, you know, a board meeting's uh, discussion about what this looks like so that they can understand how to really roadmap their own organizations. Again, no matter the size of your organization, just to understand how our culture is changing and how to be a part of it. I think it's, it's uh, really, really important. Again, the generositycommission.org, amazing, amazing resource in our country uh, to take a look at. And for me, Jane, the big, I'm gonna say hair on fire moment was understanding, or not understanding maybe, recognizing the link to volunteerism, to you know engagement in the process of democracy, serving on a jury, voting, and how that links people into the process 
of the nonprofit sector. And, um, you know, 1.8 million nonprofits in this, in this country going to work every Monday. And there are a lot of people that can be engaged, that volunteer, that work, that invest. I mean, it's a, it's a really big part of our sector. And so thank you so much for coming to, to share your knowledge. Um, I'm going to definitely try and get you back on and, and, and hear what your updates are because it's just fascinating. And again, it's such a critical piece to how we understand ourselves in the nonprofit sector. Jane Wales, Vice President of the Aspen Institute. If you were joining us um, in the green room chatter, Jane identified, you know, the Aspen Institute does programming in Aspen, but they're based in DC. So they're not, you know, they're, they're not in, uh, in Aspen uh, all the time and doing their work. But uh, again, the generositycommission.org, check them out. And as Jane mentioned, they are continuing on this research. And so what they're finding right now is still flowing in, in uh, 24 of probably April, as you mentioned, then the, the final piece will be released. Very, very interesting work. Again, everybody, I'm Julia Patrick, CEO of the American Nonprofit Academy. Jarrett Ransom, the nonprofit nerd, will be rejoining us tomorrow. We have amazing sponsors that allow us to have these conversations and support us. They include Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, your part-time controller, nonprofit thought leader, Fundraising Academy at National University, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Nerd, and Nonprofit Tech Talk. These are the folks that join us day in and day out. Jane, you really shifted my mind today. Thank you. It was a lot of fun and keep up the good work and we will look forward to learning more about the Generosity Commission and the Aspen Institute and what you are doing. Every day we sign off with this mantra and it goes like this. To stay well so you can do well. We'll see you back here tomorrow. Jane, thank you so much.